Greek fire. Greek fire wasn't your run-of-the-mill campfire. No, sir. It was a concoction so secret, Colonel Sanders would have been jealous. The Byzantines guarded this recipe like their lives depended on it, because, well, it kinda did. Imagine a medieval Gordon Ramsay in the kitchen, yelling, more pitch, more sulfur, and don't forget the secret ingredient, dragon tears. Okay, maybe not dragon tears, but you get the idea. So, what was Greek fire? Well, it was a magical blend of petroleum, resin, sulfur, and pure spite. They'd load it into these nifty siphon-like devices called siphons, creative I know, which were basically ancient flamethrowers. When the enemy ships approached, the Byzantines would unleash hell, literally. Flames shot out like an angry dragon with indigestion, engulfing everything in their path. Greek fire didn't just burn, it clung to stuff like a clingy X. Greek fire laughed at water, it kept burning even when submerged. Imagine the enemy sailors frantically jumping overboard, only to find the sea ablaze. And the best part? No one knew how to put it out. You couldn't smother it, drown it, or reason with it. It was like the Chuck Norris of fires. The Byzantines would rain Greek fire down on their foes, cackling maniacally. Enjoy your crispy sails, losers. Now historians argue about the exact recipe. Some say it had lime bitumen and unicorn tears. Okay, maybe not unicorn tears, but it sounds cooler. But one thing's for sure. Greek fire was the ultimate party trick. Imagine the Byzantine emperor at a soiree, casually sipping wine. Oh, excuse me, barbarians. Mind if I light your ship on fire? It's a family recipe. Antikythera mechanism. Ah, the Antikythera mechanism. The ancient Greek equivalent of a Swiss army knife, but instead of tweezers and a corkscrew, it had celestial gears and cosmic widgets. Picture this. It's the first century BCE, and you're a Greek engineer. You've got a bronze sheet, some spare gears, and a burning desire to impress your fellow philosophers at the next toga party. What do you do? You build the Antikythera mechanism, of course. Because nothing says, I'm a genius, like a contraption that can predict eclipses, moon phases, and the exact moment Mercury decides to photobomb Venus. Now, this bad boy was discovered in 1901 off the coast of Antikythera, hence the name. Originality wasn't their strong suit. Imagine the excitement of those divers. Hey guys, I found a rusty shoebox-sized thingamajig. And lo and behold, inside that crusty case was the world's first analog computer. Forget your fancy MacBooks. This thing was the OG MacBook Pro, minus the retina display and the ability to binge watch cat videos. So what did it do? Well, it calculated the positions of the sun, moon, and planets. You know, just casual stuff. It had dials, scales, and more gears than a steampunk octopus. The ancient Greeks were like, why gaze at the stars when you can crank this baby and watch the cosmos unfold? They'd gather around, sipping ouzo, and discuss whether Mars was in retrograde or just having a midlife crisis. The Antikythera mechanism had inscriptions all over it, like a cryptic Ikea manual. Step 1. Align the moon gear with the sun gear. Step 2. Rotate the mercury dial counterclockwise while chanting Hipparchus was a genius. And voila, you'd know when the next lunar eclipse was happening. It was like having an astrophysics professor trapped inside a bronze box. The mysterious stone spheres of Costa Rica. Those enigmatic orbs that have perplexed archaeologists, tourists, and conspiracy theorists alike. Imagine strolling through the lush jungles of Costa Rica, dodging venomous snakes and swatting away mosquitoes the size of small helicopters. Suddenly you stumble upon a massive stone sphere. It's like Mother Nature decided to play cosmic marbles and left her collection scattered across the landscape. You scratch your head, wondering if these were the world's first attempts at lawn ornaments. Now, let's talk facts. These petrospheres, over 300 of them, are found in the Dickies Delta and on Isla del Caño. Locals call them Las Bolas, which sounds more like a trendy nightclub than ancient artifacts. The extinct Dickies culture gets the credit, or blame, for these curiosities. They probably rolled these babies around like oversized stress balls during their downtime. Size matters, my friends. These spheres range from a few centimeters to over two meters in diameter. Now, how were these marvels crafted? Well, it's a simple recipe. Take a natural boulder, add a dash of hammering with other rocks, and voila, you've got yourself a petrosphere. The Dix folks were basically the original DIY enthusiasts. They even polished these bad boys with sand, because nothing says I'm fancy like a well-sanded stone ball. But what were they for? Ah, the million-dollar question. Some say they marked the path to chief's houses. Picture this. A weary traveler stumbles upon a line of spheres, and instead of GPS, they follow the cosmic breadcrumbs to the local chieftain's crib. Welcome to Chief Ugabuga's abode. Mind the spheres. Archaeologists have theories. 
Maybe these represent solar systems, or perhaps they're the Dikis version of mood rings. In 2014, UNESCO declared these stone spheres a World Heritage Site, because nothing screams heritage like giant rocks. And Costa Rica? They made these their national symbol. Move over, sloths and toucans. Las Bolas are here to steal the spotlight. Flexible glass. It's the reign of Tiberius Caesar, the guy who probably had a to-do list that included conquer the world and perfect my evil emperor laugh. And amidst all the chariot races and gladiator fights, there's a whisper, a rumor, if you will, about a glassmaker. This dude, let's call him Gaius the Glass Whisperer, claims he's cracked the code. His secret? Flexible glass. So what's the deal with this magical glass? Well, imagine a wine goblet that's not just for sipping your finest grape juice, but also for impressing your friends at parties. Gaius struts into Emperor Tiberius's court, holding his creation like a boss. The crowd gasps. The emperor raises an eyebrow, probably thinking, is this guy for real? Gaius places the glass on the table. Tiberius leans in, intrigued. And then, hold your horses. Gaius flings the goblet onto the marble floor. The room goes silent. The emperor's jaw drops faster than a chariot wheel hitting a pothole. But guess what? The goblet doesn't shatter. Nope. It just dents like it's saying, oh, you thought I'd break? Please, I'm flexible, baby. Tiberius, being the wise ruler he is, squints at Gaius. Explain yourself, he demands. Gaius, cool as a cucumber, picks up the goblet, smooths out the dent, and says, Your majesty, behold, flexible glass. Drop it, twist it, heck, use it as a stress ball. It won't break. Now here's where the plot thickens. Tiberius, instead of clapping like a proud dad, narrows his eyes. He's thinking, wait a minute. If everyone has unbreakable glass, what'll happen to our precious metals market? Gold, silver, and copper will be like yesterday's chariot races, worthless. So what does he do? He shuts down Gaius's workshop faster than you can say, bread and circuses. Flexible glass? Not on his watch. And just like that, the world missed out on indestructible glassware. Imagine the possibilities. Glass armor, bendy windows, and goblets you can use as slingshots during boring senate meetings. The Lycurgus Cup. It's the 4th century AD, and the Romans are strutting about in their toga, flexing their architectural muscles and sipping wine from goblets. Among these goblets, there exists one that stands out like a peacock at a penguin convention, the Lycurgus Cup. Imagine a cup encased in an ornate cage. Yes, a cage. Because apparently, regular cups were too mainstream for the Romans. They needed a cup that said, look at me, I'm fancy, and I come with my own protective exoskeleton. The cage itself is a masterpiece, a delicate lattice of glass, painstakingly cut and ground, it's like the ancient equivalent of those intricate snowflake patterns you find on Starbucks cups during the holiday season. But wait, there's more. The cage isn't just for show, it's got a purpose. The Lycurgus cup is made of a special glass, a dichroic glass. What's that, you ask? Well, when you shine light through it from behind, it blushes like a bashful maiden, turning a seductive shade of red. But hold your horses. When you light it up from the front, it transforms into a green hue, like a chameleon at a disco. But how? you might probably be wondering. Fear not, my curious friend. The secret lies in the glass itself. Tiny nanoparticles of gold and silver are dispersed throughout, like glitter in a craft project gone wild. These particles create a magical alloy that dances with light. The Romans stumbled upon this accidentally, probably while trying to make a regular goblet and accidentally spilled some stardust into the mix. The Lycurgus cup isn't just a show-off, it's got a story to tell. Engraved on its outer surface is a scene fit for a Greek tragedy. Meet King Lycurgus of Thrace, a man with anger management issues. He's ticked off because Dionysus, the party-loving god of wine, messed with his wine supply. So, what does Lycurgus do? He tries to kill Ambrosia, one of Dionysus' followers. Bad move, Lycurgus. Ambrosia morphs into a vine, wraps around him like a clingy ex, and, spoiler alert, kills him. And there you have it, the Lycurgus Cup, the ultimate party trick for ancient Romans. Great Pyramids of Giza. Not long ago in ancient Egypt, the pharaohs were like, hey, I need a fancy tomb, something that screams I was important. So they call up their local pyramid contractor, because yes, that was a thing. And the contractor's like, gotcha, boss. How about a massive triangular monument that'll make future tourists question their life choices? And thus, the Great Pyramid construction begins. First, they quarry these massive limestone and granite blocks. Imagine a bunch of ancient Egyptians hauling these things like they're oversized Ikea furniture. The pharaohs were probably like, make sure it's extra pointy so Ra can spot it from space. The Great Pyramid is like the LeBron James of pyramids, 230 meters, 755.75 feet, on each side at the base. 
and the height, a mere 147 meters, 481.4 feet. But hey, who needs height when you've got girth? Khufu, the pharaoh behind this pyramid scheme, was all about that bling. He wanted his tomb to be the ultimate flex. So they slapped on these smooth white limestone casings. It was like wrapping a giant gift for the afterlife. But over time, people were like, hey, free limestone, and started peeling it off. Now the Great Pyramid looks like it's wearing a half-eaten candy shell. Inside, well, it's a maze of corridors, chambers, and dead-end hallways. Imagine the ancient architects high-fiving each other, going, let's confuse the Tomb Raiders. And those Tomb Raiders? They were like the original Indiana Jones, minus the fedora. They swiped all the good stuff, gold, jewels, and the Pharaoh's favorite chariot. The Great Pyramid has this mystical connection to the cosmos. Some say it aligns with Orion's belt. Others claim it's a Wi-Fi hotspot for alien spaceships. Either way, it's like the world's oldest conspiracy theory. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed what you saw, consider hitting that subscribe button down below. It's like giving a virtual high five, and it helps support the channel. Thanks for being part of our community.